Hi, I'm Wilf Butcher, the Chief Executive of the Association for Specialist Fire Protection. The Association for Specialist Fire Protection is a primary uh, association within the uh, building sector relating specifically to passive fire protection, or passive as opposed to active. Uh, active being extinguishers, uh, fire alarms, etc. Whereas the passive element of fire protection is, in effect, the fabric of the building. Yeah, this year, well, this is our fourth uh, uh, FireX, um, and it's something of think of a step change this year. Um, rather than just simply the exhibition stand itself, we're also holding two half-day seminars uh, in the mornings that are aimed at specifically the audience of FireX to take them through the whole process of passive fire protection, all of the elements that make up passive fire protection. The primary reason behind these seminars is that they do reflect what's going on in the marketplace today. Um, the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order, for example, came into being 2006. The question is, are we operating effectively within that regulation today? Do people understand the obligations that they're required to face in terms of passive fire protection. Uh, aside from the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order, there have been many changes that have taken place in the last few decades within the fire sector. The term modern method of construction is a term we use quite frequently now. Uh, the issues here is the fabrics of the building are progressively changing. Um, so how does the, the fire performance of the building reflect those changes? We need to uh, explain at the seminars that we're doing how passive fire protection is so essential to this element of, of de design development within, within a building fabric. Also, I think it's fair to say we consider fire engineering far more than we used to. Fire protection used to be a very prescriptive thing. That's no longer the case. Iconic buildings can't necessarily be built to a traditional method of uh, the building regulations. So fire engineering needs to be employed and here we're looking at how fire engineering uh, reflects passive fire protection. Well the responsible person uh, is a person who effectively is the owner of the building or is effectively responsible for the management of the building. And we've noticed a trend in recent years, more responsible persons are coming to FireX. Therefore, our presentations need to reflect the guidance that they need to follow. And this comes back to the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order. How well do they understand, for example, follow-on trades that come into their building once it's been built? What is their knowledge in terms of how they affect compartmentation of a building? What happens if they create a hole in the wall? Do they understand the importance of passive fire protection? And the owner's responsibility is squarely on the responsible person because in a court of law, he is the person that's liable if there's a failure or fire death, in the worst scenario, within that building. So how he understands how passive fire protection should be uh, installed and maintained is absolutely critical today. In installation is, is another key issue. Um, who is the installer? Uh, now in the uh, in the construction of a building, um, that installer should be somebody who has a third party certification qualification. In other words, he is independently audited, his men are trained, he knows what he's doing. Um, post construction, follow on trades that come in will not have that training. They may be plumbers, they may be electricians. The ASFP managed to get some support funding from the CITB a couple of years ago to set up uh, the basis for a training program to upskill in passive fire protection. And we're working closely with our partners here, the Fire Protection Association. They're also exhibiting at, at FireX this year. Yeah. And both of us will be presenting um, uh, an understanding of the training programs that we've now put in place for upskilling, not just the workforce who install passive fire protection, but the follow-on trades who need to be aware of it, those who inspect, uh, and indeed the responsible person for him to get a, a better understanding. The other thing that ASFP are doing this year for the first time is we're introducing an expert clinic. Uh, this is an opportunity for people to come along, sit down, talk to an industry expert on any one of the disciplines in passive fire protection. Remember, passive fire protection is a generic term. It incorporates the structure of the building, the steel frame, 
the compartmentation, the fire stopping that passes through it, the ducts and dampers, the fire doors, glazing. It's a very big subject. So we will have on hand experienced uh, individuals from the wealth of the exhibitors that are exhibiting around the passive fire protection zone who will be on hand to give advice and guidance to anybody who wants a specific issue addressed. There are issues to be addressed going forward, uh, not least of which the uh, building regulations uh, are now just under review uh, with the intention of, of uh, a new document B or revision to document B in 2017. Um, there are issues that we as a sector would like to see seriously looked at in that process, uh, not least of which, as it stands at present, uh, third party certification is uh, voluntary. It's suggested to be appropriate by the regulations, but it's not mandatory. Um, we would like to see, if it's not to be made mandatory, more emphasis placed on the essential need for third party certification of products and third party certification of installation. Uh, we also think it's important that the future building regulations reflect the dynamics of fire engineering a little bit more. Um, when is fire engineering value engineering? Uh, you know, that's a, a, a topic that's a, a hot debate to some degree at the moment. And then, and then, as I said earlier, the issue of modern methods of construction, do they reflect the building regulations or approved document B today? Historically, those regulations are built on bricks and mortar with literally centuries of experience. Yeah. Uh, we don't have centuries of experience with some of the buildings that we're building today and it's vital that the uh, building regulations reflect that. Regulation aside, um, one could argue that fire protection is common sense. Yeah. If, you, if you do it right, then why should there be a problem? There is a problem, historically, we know there is, and, it, and, and in fact, to some degree, it starts with the designer. It starts with the owner of the building. Um, it's essential that the owner of the building and the designer understand what they want from a building in terms of its fire performance. It's, it's great to have the award-winning facade, but it's just as vital to get the fire protection right. When the architect then hands over to the main contractor, it's essential that he isn't just thinking about how can you get his price down to the lowest common denomination? Yeah. Uh, because, let's face it, if you change the specification that the architect put in place, you may not have it right. He then has a duty to hand that building over to the responsible person under something called Regulation 38. Now, I often describe this regulation as the building regulation's most closely guarded secret, because if you ask people to tell you to explain Regulation 38, they don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. And yet it is a regulation, but it essentially says that the main contractor, when passing over the building to the responsible person, should pass with it full details of all of the passive and the active systems that have been installed in that place, so that the responsible person can carry out an appropriate fire risk assessment. And fire risk assessment is an essential tool for any responsible person to ensure that the fabric of that building is maintained. Okay. Then you move to the responsible person and his duties for the life of that building to ensure that it's managed correctly. Well, one of the common comments that I hear is building control have passed it off, therefore that's acceptable, irrespective of whether they have or they haven't. Yeah. The bottom line is building control, it's a bit of a, a, a red herring to some degree. Building control do not sign off fire protection work when it's completed. The responsibility lies firmly with the company that's installed it and with the company that's employed the company that's installed it. They are the people that are legally responsible for ensuring that that building is adequately fireproof, not building control as, is, as they're often accused to be. Well, one of the questions I'm often asked is, are tall buildings more of a fire risk than any other building? And the short answer is no, if they're adequately yeah. fireproofed in the correct way. One of the problems that you've seen of late, particularly not necessarily in this country, but in the Middle East, are facade fires, yeah. where the fire is rapidly spread up the side of the building because the facade is not appropriately fire resistant or the uh, fire stopping between the facade and the uh, framework of the building is inadequately fire protected, so the fire will spread straight up void. Um, 
it comes back always to the quality of the fire protection, uh, both specification and installation that's been used in that situation. Bottom line is there should not be a problem if the building is adequately protected. When you're looking, when you're looking at older buildings, you don't have the benefit of plans uh, to follow or particular drawings of any description. So you've got to carry out a site inspection. Now there are critical areas that you should look for site inspection. Uh, and that's not just simply walking through a fire door and looking at the fire door, as important as that is, and I wouldn't underestimate that, but what's above the suspended ceiling? And one of the big issues here is that people don't necessarily inspect where they can't see. Now sometimes it's very difficult, perhaps almost impossible, to actually carry out that inspection, but some inspections should be made, particularly above ceilings and below floors, at the compartmentation point because if that's inadequate, the fire will spread straight over the top of the fire door, irrespective of how good the fire door set is. So a visual inspection is important, but what you can't do with passive fire protection is know that it's gonna work simply by looking at it. Ultimately, if you want the real test, you've got to destroy the fire barrier to determine whether it was installed correctly. So getting it right first time, I come back to that point, is absolutely essential. It's only there once, it's only there to do a job, it's never tested, there are no fire alarms with passive fire protection, so therefore you've got to be certain that what you've installed is fit for purpose should it actually have to be called into use.